So welcome everybody to the second and last for this series uh, lecture by Dr. Stephen Fleming. Uh, yesterday's slides, a couple of articles and the recording is available from the Indico events. And um, I would like to leave the floor directly to Steve so that we have uh, enough time for the questions afterwards. So please, Steve, we're looking forward. Fantastic. Well, thanks again, Maria, uh, for organizing this. And thanks, everyone, for coming along. Um, today's uh, talk will be somewhat shorter than yesterday, so hopefully we'll have time for discussion about any topics you want to raise either from yesterday or today. Um, and I'm going to focus in on some recent work we've been doing in the lab on consciousness. And some of this is still unpublished. It's the kind of thing that we're actively working on. So it's somewhat more of a narrower talk as well than yesterday, which was more of a broader overview of the landscape of metacognition research. So let's jump straight in. So the problem we're interested in is how humans have this remarkable capacity to become consciously aware of a subset of the information that's being processed by our brains. So when, for instance, our visual systems are processing information about a sunset, we're also usually aware of seeing that sunset and can comment on its properties to others. But in contrast, while we're maybe aware of the sunset, we might remain unaware of other perceptual inputs that are also being processed by the brain, such as the feeling of the clothes on our skin or changes in our posture. So a natural question then arises, which is what are the computations that enable a capacity for conscious awareness? And how are these computations being supported by the human brain? Now, these are not new questions and the study and the subjects of consciousness can often appear, I think, from the outside as somewhat abstruse and philosophical and not really amenable to scientific study. And one of the broader goals of the lecture today is to convince you that that's not the case and that we can study consciousness with an experimental and computational approach and make it part of mainstream cognitive science. So one way we can start doing that is by leveraging the impressive array of tools we now have for manipulating people's awareness of simple stimuli in the lab while keeping other features such as their attention, the input that we're giving, and their performance on the task relatively constant. And by combining these techniques with brain imaging, a range of different empirical signatures of what it means to be conscious have been identified. And I just wanna give you um, a few examples of this. So if we, for instance, make um, stimuli Invisible, so, so this can be done by using a technique called visual masking, where you present a stimulus very rapidly on the screen and then mask it with another stimulus immediately afterwards. What people, when you present that first stimulus quick enough, people often perceive just seeing the mask. So that, that first stimulus becomes effectively invisible. But what we know from brain imaging studies, um, and this is a lot of the work that's been done in Stanislas de Hen's lab in Paris, what we know from these studies is that even for these invisible masked stimuli, there is still activation in the sensory systems of the brain, and you could still decode the information that is in that stimulus from the brain activity. However, when people then um, become aware of these stimuli, when they consciously see them or hear them, you get these additional activations in the prefrontal and parietal cortex, and that's what's often referred to as global ignition, because it, it's like the brain igniting um, when it becomes aware of something. Conversely, in a condition that's known as blindsight, some patients who have damage to the back of the brain, the visual cortex, um, they may be functionally blind in the sense that to them, half of space has become um, they're, they're unable to be able to see in that half of space. And so when they go for a clinical test, the doctor may conclude that that uh, damage has caused uh, cortical blindness. But it's been discovered over the past two or three decades uh, 
that it's possible for patients with this condition to still guess at a very high degree of performance about the stimuli that are being presented in this uh, blind hemifield. And we can see this in this uh, plot here. So this is a plot of uh, blind sight patient GY, his performance in um, distinguishing the um, identity of uh, stimuli that were presented in his blind hemifield, whether they were oriented vertically or horizontally. And what you can see is that he's very good at this um, and we can titrate the performance such that his performance of distinguishing the stimuli in his normal and blind hemifield is identical. But as the condition suggests, he's um, almost completely unaware of any stimuli that are being presented in the blind hemifield. And when you then look at brain activation that contrasts um, stimuli in the normal hemifield of which he's aware of and stimuli in the blind hemifield of which he's unaware of but still able to process and respond to, you see elevated activation again in the parietal and prefrontal cortex in actually quite similar regions that we were discussing yesterday in the lecture on metacognition. And it's even possible to create these blind sight like situations in healthy observers. Um, so this is a, a classic study from Hakwan Lau and Dick Cassian, where they created this scenario where people were asked to decide whether a very briefly flashed stimulus was a diamond or a square. And then after they'd made that guess, they had to indicate whether they actually saw the target, saw this uh, stimulus here, or whether they simply were guessing. So this is our number two here is our measure of conscious awareness. And again, they use this mask where immediately after the very briefly flashed target stimulus, the mask was presented. And if this, um, if this interval is made brief enough, then people um, become unable to see the target. It becomes functionally invisible. And yet, as I'll show you on the next plot, people still can often guess above chance, even though the stimulus is invisible. And what's interesting about this um, approach is that you can then create these situations where depending on that interval between the target and the mask, which is plotted on the x-axis here, people become initially quite good at it, um, at seeing the stimulus, and then performance starts to degrade. And then once the interval between the target and the mask gets long enough, the mask is no longer effective anymore and they start to be able to, uh, they start to see it again. But these functions for performance, percent correct, and the percentage of times that the subject saw the stimulus in the dotted line here are not the same. So you can have two conditions here which are matched for performance. So these two conditions connected by the red line are relatively well matched for performance. And yet at this one, subjects are less aware of the stimulus than at this one here. So the performance capacity of the system has been equated in these two cases, but in the 33 millisecond SOA case, they're less aware than in the 100 millisecond SOA case. And you can see that um, extra these are the same data as in this plot, but now extracted out um, to show the difference. And what's interesting is, again, once we've nicely matched the performance, but has a, have a difference in conscious awareness, what you see is selective activation in the prefrontal cortex that relates to this subjective awareness component. So there are now many studies that are taking this kind of careful experimental approach to the study of consciousness, and many of them are identifying awareness with these additional frontoparietal activations that I've shown over the past few slides. But this approach has also led to an explosion of findings that are sometimes hard to integrate. Um, and there are also many different theories that are trying to accommodate these findings. And I haven't got time today to go into all the different theories. Um, and what this has meant is that um, consciousness science, there's been a sense over the past five years or so that the field of consciousness science has now amassed quite a lot of data, but we're at somewhat of an impasse. And this is a recent meta-analysis from the Mudrich's group that actually came out just a few days ago. Um, it's been uh, available as a preprint for, for a few months, but it, it was published a few days ago. Um, and what they showed here is that 
in effect, you can um, document different neural correlates of consciousness when you, when you look through the literature across the entire brain surface. And perhaps more concerningly, depending on the theoretical perspective that was adopted in a particular article, different activation patterns were each being used to support different theories. So this, just to give you an example, this um, plot here down the bottom right, there's a theory of consciousness known as re recurrent processing theory or local recurrence theory that suggests that what is important for consciousness is local activations in sensory areas. And you can see that this paper is arguing for this theory tend to pick studies that show activations related to consciousness in the sensory cortex, whereas studies um, that are being used in support of this global ignition signature tend to report findings that are consistent with global ignition. So there's a sense in which we have lots of theories, we have lots of data, but we're at a point where we need to, I think, take a step back and think more carefully about what we're actually trying to explain here. So why have we reached this impasse? Um, so I recently suggested one reason for this in um, an article that I perhaps cheekily entitled Theories of Consciousness are Solutions in Need of Problems. Um, and this article points out that theorizing in consciousness science suffers from a lack of functional constraints. So the test of a good theory in psychology is, um, or neuroscience is often whether it can explain how a system performs a um, particular uh, function. Um, and this, for instance, if, you're, if you have a theory of vision, then you want your theory to explain how we categorize objects or a theory of memory should explain how we remember or forget. Um, but I think in this respect, consciousness has traditionally been um, different and most theories are not constrained in this way. They often start from within and they try to build up a theory that captures some ineffable um, magic property of experience. And as I was saying earlier in the talk, this approach has identified intriguing data features linked to consciousness, but ultimately I think it's unlikely to work as an explanation because it relies too heavily on our intuitions about what type of or what property of experience we're trying to explain. So in other words, there is no functional or often no functional target of, of a theory of consciousness. And this, this um, the idea that we need functional targets was um, originally proposed in psychology by uh, the vision scientist David Marr, and he proposed that what we should aim for in cognitive science is um, explanations that cross different levels of analysis. So in the case of, for instance, um, explaining or understanding why a bird has feathers, we need to first know that feathers are for flying and that feathers are a key component of a system that flies before we can start to understand the algorithm um, for how, it, um, how, the, how the feathers achieve uh, flight. So if we didn't know that feathers were for flying, it'd be very hard to understand um, their function. And similarly, within psychology, we can explain functions at the level of um, implementation, such as what particular brain areas or circuits or brain cells are doing. Um, and we can also start explaining uh, functions at the level of the algorithm that's being, uh, that, that is implementing that function, such as reinforcement learning or the idea that we have internal cognitive representations. But again, it's hard to make much sense um, of the algorithm or the implementation without knowing the why of that function. What is it for? What is it doing? Um, and in the case of, for instance, um, this, this uh, diagram is taken from a paper on social cognition. So is the function of this circuit for cooperation, for competition, and, and so on. And I think that most theories of consciousness are currently situated either at this um, implementational level, so they're trying to say something about the different brain networks involved, or the algorithmic level. And very few are incorporating constraints at the functional level. Right? So there's, no, um, there's, there's not much theorizing on what consciousness is for. And I think if we can start understanding that, 
that's going to constrain the both the algorithm and the implementation. So what might consciousness be for? Well, on this um, on this topic, I've been quite influenced by uh, my uh, the by the psychologist uh, Chris Frith and his views on this topic. And Chris has uh, very clearly in his writings pointed out that there is there might be many functions of consciousness, but one that is very hard to argue with. That, um, and that is a clear and obvious function of human awareness is the capacity to share information with others. So by definition, conscious experience is the one outcome of our brain's information processing that can be shared with others. So if you can be back to the example at the beginning of the talk, I'm aware of the sunset. And the reason that I can say that I'm aware of the sunset is because it is available for reporting and sharing, whereas other information that's not available for reporting or sharing is functionally unconscious. And I've also recently discovered, this is a bit of an aside, but perhaps interesting, that um, the neuroscientist Horace Barlow also held similar views. So Barlow, like Chris Frith, was also an esteemed British psychologist and neuroscientist, and he was a fellow of the Royal Society in the UK. And he's also uh, the grandson of Charles Darwin. And he works as, um, uh, he's a famous neuroscientist who worked on uh, sensory processing, um, but his views on consciousness are perhaps less well, well known. And they appear largely in, in, in um, a couple of book chapters. And the key claim similar to uh, Chris Frith's point is that consciousness can only be understood through the lens of its social or communicative function. And so Bala says here, what makes the pursuit of communal goals possible is our ability to communicate fluently with each other, which is surely the direct and obvious result of our being conscious. On the current hypothesis, conscious experience gives one the facility of communicating our experience to others. That is its point, purpose and survival value. So how then might we leverage these insights on function to inform a science of consciousness? So first of all, I think it's useful to consider what is it that we are sharing with others? And this has been something that philosophers, uh, going back to David Hume, have um, puzzled about. And they've pointed out that conscious awareness is characterized by some abstract properties, not only by its content, what we are communicating to others, whether it's the sunset or the smell of baked bread or whatever it is, um, but also by the strength or vividness of different types of mental content. And crucially, content statements can be decoupled from strength statements. So I'm able to tell you that I am strongly aware of the smell of baked bread, but only partially aware of a headache or vice versa. Um, so in other words, our mental state communication system should have both strength and content components and the property of mental strength, this awareness of aspects, should be flexibly uh, applicable to different mental content. And this Humean idea has been recently resurrected and comprehensively outlined by the philo philosopher Jorge Morales, who proposes that there is a property of mental strength shared by all conscious experiences that explains their degree of felt intensity. Um, so in other words, what Jorge is arguing here is that our experiences and how we talk to them, how we talk about them with others have a degree of phenomenal magnitude. And this is something that we need to think carefully about when we're building a theory of awareness. Um, and in the same way, when we can see this kind of phenomenal magnitude code um, start to emerge naturally when people are asked to share their experiences. So this is a nice set of experiments by um, Chris Frith and Bahadur Barami and their colleagues. And what subjects are being asked to do here is that there's two people seated at a, um, computer, a pair of computer screens and they're being shown um, in some cases, the same information on the screen, in some cases, different information, um, but it's a similar task as the one that I just described yesterday in relation to metacognition. 
they're asked to um, decide whether the first or second interval contains a slightly brighter stimulus. And this is a difficult task because the stimuli are made quite faint. Um, but what's interesting here is that now it's a social situation. So rather than um, just making an indi their individual decisions, they have to come to some collective joint decision. And so when they, when they disagree, um, what the experiment has asked them to do is to discuss who um, might be, uh, they, they're asked to discuss and come to a joint answer about what, they're, what, they're, um, what was presented. And after, so, so this, is a, this is a situation where first the individuals in the, in the experiment are giving um, simple content statements. So statements about the content of perception, was it in the first interval or the second interval? And they're then asked to discuss and share their experiences with each other so that they can come to this joint decision. And these are the kind of things that were said. So this experiment was done in Denmark, but this, these are the translations. So they say things like, I saw nothing, I didn't see anything, I took a wild guess, way to go. You know, they're, they're basically coming up with um, a joint language for describing the strength or confidence they have in their perceptual experiences. And in the paper, it's shown that Success, more successful pairs of observers were ones who tended to conform to a joint language for sharing these phenomenal magnitudes. And so this um, allows what's really um, striking about these experiments is that this kind of sharing of awareness of content allows the pair of, of, of observers to perform better than the best individual working alone. And that's pretty striking, right? So that suggests that there's some super additive effect of working together, um, even for very simple uh, perceptual tasks. You can actually do better together than the best person can working alone. And a Bayesian explanation of that is what we're effectively doing is transmitting um, strength-weighted content statements or con confidence-weighted confidence statements, uh, content statements about the world. So what I want to do in the rest of the talk is describe a potential framework for modeling these aspects of how we communicate mental content and how they might be realized in neural computations that we can study using brain imaging. So in a, re in a recent theoretical paper, I proposed a framework that we call the higher order state space model. And this formalizes both content and awareness of content in the language of hierarchical models of uh, perception. And so these models are increasingly popular, not just in consciousness science, but in cognitive science more generally. And they assume that perception depends on interactions between top down and bottom up processes. Um, and so this, the general idea here is that the mind is testing hypotheses about the best explanation of what is causing the sensory data coming into the senses. Um, and this kind of hypothesis testing can explain visual illusions such as this one. So we perceive, we tend to perceive the left hand dots as bumps coming out of the page and the right hand dots as depressions going into the page, even though the dots are effectively identical. And one explanation of this is that our perceptual systems assume that light is usually coming from above. And so the shadows here are consistent with bumps and depressions. A similar um, explanation can be applied to uh, illusions such as this one. So we perceive the, the, the patch B looks lighter than patch A. And the reason we our brains assume this, or one explanation of this, is that we think patch B must have been lighter because it started off in shadow. Even though actually if you took a light meter and measured the luminance coming off your computer screens, Patch A and patch B are identical shades of gray, and you can appreciate this by joining them up with this bridge. So to return to the general idea of generative models of perception, the idea is that what our brains are trying to do is work out the best explanation of the outside of, of what's coming in from the senses. Um, it has impoverished input, so this is an ill-posed problem, and it can achieve um, this goal by updating its representations of this hypothesis 
based on error signals um, coming from above, coming from below, and um, adjusting its uh, predictions or hypotheses about the world based on these incoming error signals. So to return to the model, these models in general are pretty good at capturing inference on content. So we can model using this kind of approach, whether a stimulus is being inferred as being an apple or an orange. But there's been much less work on extending these models to capture awareness of content. And this is what we've been working on in my lab. Um, and what we've proposed is that we need to add an additional higher order layer to standard perceptual generative models. And this is what we label um, awareness states. And by doing this, we can start to naturally capture psychological features of awareness of content. So for instance, we can capture the fact that awareness um, is an abstraction about the presence or absence of perceptual content that can support the communication of mental strength. So I can say I'm aware of a dog or aware of a cat or unaware of a, a headache or whatever it is that I want to communicate to you. And so we need this flexible um, abstract magnitude code to enable that kind of sharing of information. Um, that also implies awareness states are relatively low dimensional, ranging from encoding no experience of a particular property to encoding clear experience of that content. So we can go one step further and formalize this model by putting in parameters that govern how different layers of the system interact. And I haven't got time to go through the details of this. The details are actually not so important for the argument that I'm making here. But what is important is the structure of the model. Um, so these higher level awareness states are um, simple and abstract, and they determine whether the perceptual states lower down the system are present and high dimensional or absent and therefore uh, low dimensional and simple. Um, and this induces a natural asymmetry to the state space. So whereas being aware of content is associated with a greater probability of there actually being content in my perceptual system, um, being unaware of content is um, associated with a more um, restricted set of experiences. Right, so being aware is associated probabilistically in a model like this with first order content actually being in my perceptual system. Now that's not exclusively the case because we know from studies of dissociations like in cases of blindsight that it does seem to be possible to be unaware of content being there and yet still having that content in some sense represented because it can still guide behavior. Um, so in the paper, I show how um, such asymmetries in this architecture can mimic signatures of global ignition that have been associated with uh, global workspace models. But here, these, um, these, are the, these signatures of ignition are reinterpreted as reflecting asymmetric prediction errors. So in this case, um, what, what you're looking at here is a simulation of the magnitude of updates, the KL divergence between um, the prior and the posterior, having seen some incoming sensory data. And what we see is that there's just a generally greater sum and magnitude of prediction error on scene compared to unseen uh, trials in the simulation. And the reason for this is just because of this asymmetry in, in the state space. There's more things to update when you see something than when you don't see something. So we can start to reinterpret these signatures of global ignition as perhaps reflecting a greater magnitude of prediction error rather than um, just reflecting the broadcast of information. So we can now go back in a sense to um, the con more conceptual model when we now we have this uh, computational framework in, in place, we can then start making some qualitative predictions we can test in experiments. So specifically, if we want to isolate awareness-related computation, then we would be looking for low-dimensional content invariant um, signals that actively encode the presence or absence of content elsewhere in the system. 
And in contrast, uh, these signatures of awareness-related computation are qualitatively distinct to those expected for brain areas encoding perceptual content, which should show rich and content-specific uh, responses. So in the last few minutes of the talk, I want to just tell you about some uh, recent and unpublished data that we've been collecting uh, to test these hypotheses. So this is a study that's been led by Oliver Warrington and Nadina Dijkstra um, in collaboration with Peter Koch. So the key idea here is that we can test the model by training people to generate predictions, not only about the content of a stimulus that we're going to show to them, but also their awareness of that content. So on some trials, they might get a cue before a stimulus that signals that the stimulus is likely to be a, um, uh, um, a face, for instance, um, and that they are also likely to be aware of that face. Um, and if, in fact, that stimulus turns out to be a house, then this creates a prediction error at the level of perceptual content. But if that stimulus turns out to be nothing at all, just a patch of noise, that creates a surprising absence of either a face or a and that creates a prediction error at the, this more abstract level of awareness. So we can then simulate, we can take our model and simulate um, the model for all possible combinations of cues and stimuli and record prediction errors at different levels of the architecture. And our key hypothesis was that prediction errors on content and awareness of content should be dissociable in both time and space. So specifically, we expected the prefrontal cortex to support late prediction errors on awareness, whereas the visual cortex should reflect early prediction errors on content, such as whether an image is a face or a hat. So the predictions regarding the time of these activations are being tested in an MEG study that we're still running, but the initial predictions regarding this localization of um, prediction errors have recently been tested in an fMRI study, and it's these results that I'm going to share with you today. So each subject in our study underwent both a behavioral session and an fMRI session. And so in the behavioral session, they were asked to provide a rapid response here, this FHRN response, as to whether the image that we presented to them was either a face, a house, or, a, or nothing, a patch of noise. And in the fMRI paradigm, they, there was no active task for them to do apart from on 10% of trials, they were just asked to um, detect whether there was a uh, slightly green tinge to the stimulus. So this is just an incidental task. It encourages them to keep paying attention to the stimulus, but we're not asking them to perform any task on the um, related to the paradigm itself. And importantly, in both of these cases, before each stimulus was presented, we showed them this probabilistic cue, which could either be a square or a circle of two different colors. And each cue is a compound cue. So in this case, if the cue is blue, you're more likely to end up getting a, um, uh, let's get this right here. So yeah, if the cue is blue, you're more likely to get a face. If the cue is yellow, you're more likely to get a, a house stimulus. Um, and in tandem, if the cue is a circle, you're more likely to get a noise patch. You're more likely to get nothing. And um, if the cue is a square, you're more likely to get something. So these are um, compound cues that reflect the joint probability of awareness and content. And the mappings between the cues and these contingencies were re reversed halfway through the experiment. So we're not um, looking at just people encoding colors or shapes. We're looking at the meaning of the cue for um, the probability of seeing these different stimuli. So we can then simulate our model. This is a simulation of um, the KL divergence or the prediction error at different levels of the model um, uh, by implementing um, the model as a Bayesian graphical network. And we feed in stimuli sampled from unique Gaussian distributions that represent face, house, and noise. 
And we can then set the priors ourselves at different levels of the model using the actual probabilities provided by the cues in the experiment. And we can then record the average prediction error at both the perceptual and awareness state levels. So as expected at the perceptual level here, the prediction errors are mainly driven. You get more prediction error when the content violates your prediction. So whether you get a, um, when you get a house, but you expect a face or, or a face when you expect a house. But this level is relatively insensitive to expectations about awareness, about content versus noise. In contrast, at this higher level, this, high, this um, higher order level, this awareness state level, now the prediction errors are mainly driven by the distinction between the presence or absence of any type of content. And at this level, the model no longer cares about whether the presented image is a, a face or a house. So we could then use these patterns of prediction error across the 12 different conditions of the experiment as regressors for our behavioral and brain imaging data. So in the behavioral data, we first um, confirmed that there was a behavioral impact of these cues on people's response times. And this is what you can see here. So this is the response time of a cue that is invalid. So when you get a cue that, for instance, predicts you're going to get a face, but you actually get a house, that would be an invalid cue. Um, and we subtract away the response times for the valid cues. And what this shows is the fact that these bars are a bit above zero, significantly so, is that people tend to be a bit slower when the queue was invalid. And importantly, this was the case both for um, the validity of the identity queue, whether the stimulus was predicted to be a face or a house, and the validity of the awareness queue, whether subjects were expecting content or nothing. Um, and we can do something slightly more sophisticated, rather than just looking at valid and invalid trials, we can regress the KR divergence from the model or the prediction errors from the model on the response times. And we see that um, in a multiple regression analysis, we see that both perceptual and awareness prediction errors impacted response times, but that these two regressors did not interact. So that suggests independent influences on behavior. So these behavioral results then motivate a search in our imaging data for neural correlates of these two types of prediction error from the model. Um, and when we, when we look for those neural correlates, first of all, we can look for neural correlates of the perceptual prediction error. And so we found um, those signals in the extra stride visual cortex, um, in the ventral visual stream, where we expect uh, stimuli such as faces and houses to be processed. And um, this cluster activates most strongly for faces that are surprising. So when people expect a house, we get, get a face, this cluster of voxels activates most strongly in those cases. But this cluster is insensitive to the awareness level um, prediction error. In contrast, when we look for regions that encode these awareness prediction errors, so whether people expect noise and see content or expect content and see noise, we find we now find a cluster in the prefrontal cortex towards the front of the brain, where the greatest activations here are seen when an un when sorry when it, the expectation of the absence of content is confirmed by a noise patch, so these gr green bars over here, or when the expected presence of content is confirmed by a face or a house being presented over here. But importantly, again, this cluster is insensitive to the content of the, 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 the cue, and so seems to care more about awareness than perceptual prediction errors. So to summarize this, we found that not only do two types of prediction error impact people's behavior. They also show dissociable neural correlates, and that's exactly as predicted by our, our model. And we're now um, taking this forward in a number of different directions to try and understand what is it about the neural code in the prefrontal cortex that is supporting these abstract um, awareness prediction errors. We're also 
as I mentioned earlier, running an MEG study where we can look for the timing of these late abstract awareness states. So just to wrap up, um, I think that consciousness science is in good shape. It's reached a bit of an impasse because we've amassed a whole bunch of different data on paradigms that have been developed to look at the difference between the awareness and unawareness of simple stimuli. And I think what's needed now is to think carefully about the functional constraints. So what is awareness for? And then we can start to reverse this arrow. So rather than going from data to, um, sorry, rather than going from experiments to data, we need to um, go, we need to, we need to go from um, a theory of what the system is trying to do. And in this case, I think one powerful constraint there is to think about what is it that we are trying to communicate to others. And we can then search for elements of this computation in our neural and behavioral data. And in doing so, we might actually be able to then reinterpret previous neural signatures of consciousness, such like um, global ignition, in terms of the type of computation they support. So I'll stop there. And um, I want to thank uh, my lab um, and in particular, um, Oliver and Nadina and Peter, who have been heavily involved in this second experiment that I presented in today's talk. And I'd be very glad to take questions on either the work from today or yesterday. And it's been a pleasure uh, to join you for these two lectures. Thank you so much. Very, very interesting. Thank you. And it's nice we have time for questions. So I would like to uh, to see hands or people. Stephen, please. I saw Stephen Burke yes. first. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes. OK, so you're saying that consciousness, the main purpose of consciousness is to communicate, uh, but that would imply it's strongly bound up with language and you didn't say anything about language. So how would you see a connection there? Yeah, so, um, so I... I I don't think that the purpose of consciousness is to um, communicate. I think that um, the consciousness provides um, is is the subset of communicable information, um, and that in a sense where it, it's providing. Um, let me let me start again. So. I think the connection to language, the short answer to your question is that I think language is um, a system that we often filter the communication of conscious information. But I think that that doesn't mean that you need language to be conscious. Um, and I think that the um, in a lot of the experiments that were we're doing here where there's no language involved. There's, in fact, this last experiment, there was no task involved at all. So I think that um, language is clearly a um, very flexible system that enables us to communicate our mental states, but I don't think it's prerequisite for communicating of mental states. And I think that, yeah, I just want to um, refine the definition or the, the assumption here. I don't think that consciousness is for communication, but I think that um, one functional constraint on understanding how conscious information is represented in the brain is to look at it through the lens of uh, communication. Thank you. Hopefully that makes a bit of sense. Stephen, are you covered? Your hand is still up. Would you like to say something in addition? No, that's okay, thanks. Pleasure. The next is Apostolos, please. Hello, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, it was very interesting. Um, so I'm a data science, uh, the IT department. So my question is rather, um, a little bit technical on the model that you created uh, on for prediction. Um, 
I just want to have like more details. You said that uh, you used a neural network, and um, I'm curious to know uh, what were the uh, variables that were used. The outcome you said it was different uh, uh, objects sort of face. Um, yeah, that's my question. Sure. Yeah. Um, so we're working with uh, Bayesian graphical models, and it's. These are actually very simple models where we um, are implementing them as different um, layers in a network where it's a generative model. So the highest level is trying to generate expectations about what's in the next level below and so on. Um, and the very simplest models we can just write down and solve using exact inference. Um, so there's no uh, neural network involved. There's no approximations involved. These, these are, um, we can solve it using um, a system of Bayesian equations. Um, so we do that in MATLAB. Uh, but for more complicated networks, when we have more realistic representations or we want to infer multiple variables at the same time, we often use probabilistic programming languages like JAGS or STAN. Um, so these are not feed-forward neural networks in the sense of neural nets that are often used in machine learning. These are Bayesian graphical models where we make assumptions about the representations in the different levels. But you could, I think it'd be an interesting project to connect those two um, those two approaches up. So you could imagine that the perceptual representations, first of all, need to be learned from the input, in which case you might want a feed-forward neural net that is building some representations that are then used as part of the generative model. But we haven't, we haven't gone that far yet. Thank you very much for your answer. Thank you both. Uh, I don't see any other hands rising at this moment. Let me ch check the chat. I don't see anything either. I have a few questions, but I don't want to, to go first before other people have the chance. Otherwise, um, I wanted to ask a few questions very interesting is it is it um, my lack of english language or a far-fetched e extrapolation that the word consciousness can encompass sometimes things that have to do with one person's morale or values mm. well so i think the word conscience um is often used in, re in, re in reference to moral values. But I think it's an interesting um, question to what extent conscience and consciousness go hand in hand. Um, and there is a lot of recent interest on the moral status of consciousness, which I think is a really important topic, which is, should we in some sense care about whether a system is conscious or not? And I think this becomes increasingly important when we're starting to take more functional computational approaches to consciousness, which is what we, in a sense, I think we need to do that if we're gonna have a science of consciousness. The potential danger there is that you're then creating knowledge about how to implement artificial consciousness. I think we're a long way away from that and I don't think it's just gonna emerge in tandem with further work on AI or further work on generalized intelligence. I think intelligence and consciousness are distinct as hopefully came across in the talk. I think there's particular mm -hmm. properties that can um, enable awareness of information and we might want to think about what those properties are, but I don't think it's just going to, creating an ever more complicated machine is not going to suddenly give you um, awareness and that's probably a good thing. Um, but to, and, and the reason that's probably a good thing is because we don't want to, um, I think we need to be, as your question suggests, we need to be careful about the moral implications of work on consciousness. Um, I, 
I don't know. I, I think that um, I think that there's still lots of work to be done though, to understand that both people's society's intuitions about consciousness and morality, and also to understand the connection between different types of awareness and and um, moral concern. So it seems obvious in a sense that one important component of moral concern for others is suffering or pain. Now, yeah. do you do you need do you need to have the machinery for awareness of pain? Does it even make sense to think about unconscious pains? Um, these are all questions that philosophers are, have been talking thinking about for a long time. But I think we as a society are now starting to having have to grapple with these things. Yeah. Thank you very much. In, indeed, what a nice field that has such a brilliant philosophical future. So I have here um, Sylvia, whom I saw first, who would like to ask a question, followed by Luis, followed by Joshua. Sylvia, hello. We, we, cannot, can't hear you. we no. cannot hear you. If you uh, find uh, difficult to arrange the microphone, you can type the question in the chat and then Luis can ask and then we come back to you. Cool. So Luis, please go ahead. Okay, Wait. thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay, so well, th thanks. Uh, first, thanks for the talk. It was really, really interesting. Um, I am quite intrigued by the blind side phenomenon. I mean, I, I knew about that before, and I think it's, of course, a very interesting place to study awareness. One question is whether, after several trials, of course, well, people start to develop confidence on the on mm. what they can guess or quote unquote guess. I was wondering whether there have been experiments or, or plans to study whether blind sight people can learn different features. I mean, after you can do several trials for horizontal lines, several trials for texture, several trials for vertical lines, etc. So it may be quite interesting to see whether after many of those different confidence inducing trials, they could uh, somewhat uh, develop a, a substitute way of seeing things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's of course, uh, it would take a lot of time, but uh, it, it sounds really intriguing that uh, how much they can reconstruct through that second order yeah. processing, uh, some sort of reconstruction of what they are seeing. So I don't know if there's already some work on that. Yeah, that's a great idea. Great question. Um, so I think what you're referring to has been sometimes described as type two blindsight in the literature, this idea that you if, if the blindside patient gets enough experience with what their capabilities are, then you, in a sense, become, potentially you become functionally um, quite similar to a sighted person because you are able to identify things with high confidence. And when confidence has been studied in patients who are quite experienced subjects in blind sight experiments like patient GY he's ta he's taken he's almost like a professional research subject now because he's taken part in so many experiments um and his his confidence judgments his level of confidence in getting the answer right is now quite high just um in terms of when it's been measured experimentally and also anecdotally he, he will he will say you know he feels like he was getting the answer right but importantly on any given trial and this comes back to what i was talking about with metacognition yesterday on any given occasion he's unable to distinguish whether he's right or wrong so the general sense of yeah i'm a blind side subject i can do this stuff seems to be in place well, with enough experience but the insight that he or she has to whether they're getting the judgment correct is this this idea of metacognitive efficiency or sensitivity is, is quite impaired compared to uh, normal size. Um, 
so that's one limitation that seems to be hard to overcome um so even with plenty of training and experience it seems to be hard to re in a sense reprogram metacognition to give you the insight into how well you're doing and that probably tells us something about the limitations of in a sense restoring awareness in blindsight the other thing that seems to be quite hard for even experienced blindsight patients to do is spontaneously guess so when they're in an experiment and they're told there was just a stimulus in the past second what was it then they can answer that with a high degree of accuracy but when they're just sitting quietly alone or when they're not told that something might have been presented they're functionally blind and so that i think again provides us with some um interesting constraints on what it means to be conscious what it means to be conscious is not only the ability to discriminate and categorize the world it's also the ability to spontaneously um spontaneously be able to communicate it to others which i think is again just one, to what I was one very brief follow-up it sounds really yeah. interesting to try to i mean an experiment where they are asked to to determine whether a stimulus was presented or not or the time when it is presented would be a nice exploration of that specific uh, apparent uh, uh, yes. impediment. That's yeah, very interesting. Yeah, timing, time perception. I don't know whether anyone's actually systematically worked on this. Um, yeah, these patients are relatively rare, although Holly Bridges Lab in Oxford has now got a quite a strong pipeline of patients who are coming through her lab. She's a specialist on blindside. So that's really interesting. I don't know of anyone doing time, time perception work, but I totally agree. Being able to identify when something occurred could isolate this property of detection that seems to be impaired. Yeah, okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you both. So if uh, Joshua can wait, I'll go back to Celia, <coughs> who has asked the first, and her questions are in the chat, and they are the following. What made you choose the house, face, and noise cues? And second, how uh, did you test with three different types of cues that would be radically different? If so, were the results similar or not? Yeah, thanks for the question. So first, so we chose house, face, and noise, both to keep things as simple as possible. So we just wanted two types of content and then nothing. And the reason we chose houses and faces for the two types of content is that um, there are a number of studies in high level vision that show that faces in, in particular are represented in a dedicated or in, in a specialized um, area of the ventral visual cortex called the fusiform face area. Um, now that's just one node in the network, but it seems to be particularly important for face processing. And similarly, there's a, another patch of cortex which seems particularly um, engaged in the processing of scenes. And one stimulus that's really good at driving this scene selective cortex is happens to be houses. Um, so there's a there's a long, slightly bizarre tradition of high level vision research using faces and houses because we know that these stimuli drive these two patches of cortex really uh, well. And so that we wanted to use stimuli that would be well, um, easy to distinguish using brain imaging. Um, so we could test these hypotheses about prediction errors. Um, but absolutely, I, I um, agree it's necessary to generalize these findings to more realistic, more high dimensional stimulus sets. And the, we're, we're working on some designs along those lines at the moment. And I would expect the results, if the model is along the right lines, I would expect the potentially the brain regions in the visual cortex that respond to content specific prediction errors, they will naturally differ according to the content. But I expect this 
high level awareness state in the model, if that is along the right lines, that should be encoded similarly, regardless of the content involved. So I don't know if Sylvia, thank you very much. I don't know if Sylvia, um, with or without the camera. She's saying thanks a lot in the chat, so. Yeah, but maybe she can speak or, no, you cannot. Fine, no problem. So I just wanted to, uh, for a clarification, I understand that you agree as future research uh, topic to get different uh, kind, types of cues and that you expect uh, different results. But when you envisage different types of cues, would you mean you would mean what? Something that is totally abstract in, or what would? Um, yeah, so I guess it depends on whether we're talking about the cues or the stimuli here. So if it was, so stimuli we're thinking about using more um, naturalistic stimulus sets, um, just a whole range of natural images that we can classify, potentially using neural net approaches um, to learn the space of the stimuli rather than giving it to our model directly. Um, but in terms of cues, Yes, the, I mean, a, a more natural way of doing that is to, rather than giving people abstract cues like circles and squares, we get them to learn the probabilities of different stimuli over time. Um, and this provides a more naturalistic way of inducing expectations about different types of stimuli. Mm -hmm. So that's one, that's one thing we're thinking about. Um, Yes, yeah, Sylvia contributed content that um, uh, has emotional content attached, like violent scenes, etc. I understand. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So emotional content would be another thing that would be very interesting to look at through the lens of these kind of models, because one thing we are interested in is, again, how people become aware of emotional content. Do they use similar machinery as awareness of other types of content? Thank you. So back to Joshua. Thank you for waiting for so long. Please go ahead. Uh, no problem. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Um, I have a question that is a bit less related to the content and a bit more to your field of study, sure. uh, because it also has, has come up uh, like for, for me coming from like a very strong belief in science and then talking to people who are, I would say are more like spiritually oriented and do not have a share the strong belief in science and say, um, yeah, okay, there are different states of consciousness, but people are um, too afraid to do research on it because they are afraid to look ridiculous in this field. And so I'm wondering, is this really um, an issue that you have, that you have to think about how you, um, how you make your proposals for research to, to not look too spiritualistic, to not be pushed into this direction and the other way around, do you have to be also aware because yeah kind of everyone thinks at least they have a consciousness or um so there's a, a big issue in or a big um like yeah everyone in society has an opinion about about this basically so are you are you aware about this this implications as well so like both directions how how do you approach with your research topics and how do you approach this then towards society with your publications yeah, it's, it's a great it's a great question. So, um, and it's an important issue that we do grapple with. And I think that um, the the study of consciousness is so on the scientific side, it has for a long time had a somewhat murky and um, problematic reputation um, as a field of study within psychology and neuroscience. So when you when you tell people you study consciousness, a lot of people kind of raise their eyebrows within our field because that's still a word that we're not really many use. Um, and it, it was certainly the case 30 or 40 years ago that this was supposedly something that was off limits. And especially if you were a young aspiring researcher and you wanted to get tenure, and you wanted to get grants and so on, you should not use the word consciousness. Now that has changed, and I think that's good. It's changed quite a lot in the past decade or two, and it's changed 
um, to a large degree, thanks to prominent researchers, people like Francis Crick, um, who had the security of a Nobel Prize to be able to start writing towards the end of his life about how consciousness was an important problem that could be solved using the tools of science. And he and his colleagues have, um, I think, done a great service to the field by making it a more respectable area of study. And we now have journals and societies and an ecosystem that allows us to pursue this work. And in fact, as a side note, um, seeing as we're talking to a European audience, the ERC has been a, a, an extremely strong supporter of consciousness science. And it's probably easier to do this research in Europe than it is to do in, in America, where NIH funding has traditionally been less um, friendly, I think, towards consciousness science. Now, the broader, um, so that's more, I guess, a commentary on the, pro, on the, on the kind of practicalities of doing science in this field. Um, I think the public perception of it is really interesting and it, it does often get skewed by some, and inevitably, because that's what the media like. The media like more outlandish theories. The media are probably not going to, you know, write a front page article about the latest slightly arcane computational model or experiment that we've done on consciousness, like the stuff I presented today. But if someone is writing down a theory that suggests the entire universe is conscious or rocks are conscious, or then they're going to get covered, right? So there's this sense in which that, I think, is dangerous because it loses the respectability of the field and it potentially erodes enthusiasm for funding it as a topic of scientific research. So what I'm trying to do in my lab and quite a few other people in this field are trying to, in a sense, bring consciousness back into mainstream cognitive science as something that we can study. And to do that, we need to define it clearly, which is why I think the communication aspect is a nice definition. Um, and then we can start designing experiments and models and so on. Um, so that, yeah, that, that to me is a, a somewhat dangerous. This is a field in which there can be often outlandish things said about consciousness, um, which might, the problem is they might, might be true. Right? So that's, this is the thing. If you want to be a good scientist in this area, you can't just say that's bonkers because it could actually be true. But I think we have to be careful about putting too much weight on improbable uh, predictions. Um, and then I think the final part of your question was about whether we get pushback from kind of everyone thinking they know what consciousness is. Um, and I, I haven't necessarily encountered that so much. I think, I think if you are interested in the science of consciousness, then I think, you know, that people are interested in how it might work. I think if you are a firm dualist and you think that science, neuroscience will never explain the subjective aspects of the mind, then you won't necessarily be convinced um but that's i think okay i mean i'm not trying to claim that um you know we're we're in the business of trying to understand the soul and god and so on so you know there's we we can leave we can leave room for for people's beliefs on those matters while still trying to pursue a more mechanistic explanation does that does that kind of make sense yes thank you very much for answering for giving this insight thank you Thank you. That was really very interesting question. And thank you for this uh, answer, uh, Steve, <coughs> which leaves the door open and scientific at the same time. Thank you. So if we, I don't see any other uh, comments, etc. I have uh, dozens of questions, but I would uh, very much prefer that uh, when all restrictions are lifted with news from this current research, we could have a, a CERN session uh, à l'ancienne in the amphitheater with the speaker present and we can exchange more news and uh, feedback on this research. So once again, thanks very much. The slides will be there from today in a few minutes. Yesterday's material uh, and uh, the video, thanks to the audiovisual support experts, is there. One of the video versions contains also subtitles, so, so please um, 
feel free to visit the material. I have put also, I will put all the links that are mentioned by the speaker. Thank you very, very much, very much, Steve, for this series. And thanks everybody for staying until now. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks everyone. Thank you very much.